Hey, everybody. Uh, hey, welcome to uh, my show today. I'm going to take a bit of a different uh, approach uh, with what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, five books uh, that have been influential on me about Normandy, uh, my research, my understanding, uh, and ones I think you should definitely check out. Uh, so we'll do five. There won't be uh, any real format. I'm just going to talk about a couple in, in order I've decided, but it doesn't mean that it has to be that way. Uh, I can stop for questions. If you have book suggestions, I highly recommend uh, telling me, put it in the chat, and we can talk about those. You can ask me my questions generally uh, about uh, Normandy books, ones I like, maybe ones I don't like, uh, anything like that. Uh, so uh, th I wanted to start today um, just real quick, talking about uh, who I am, what I do, uh, and kind of why I do this. So because uh, not everybody might know that. So I'm doing my PhD. I'm nearly finished uh, doing my PhD uh, at the University of Ottawa. My main topic of my dissertation actually is the memory of the Battle of Hong Kong uh, and kind of how that developed over the decades since the battle. Uh, so that's quite a, a complicated topic that maybe I could uh, talk about at another time. And if anybody wants me to discuss that or do a video or something like that, please let me know uh, either here or in the comments afterwards. That would be uh, uh, really helpful to kind of see what you guys would like. Um, to see from me moving forward. Uh, so that's the kind of how I got into this whole history thing. I did a, a battlefield tour in 2016 uh, with the Canadian Battlefields Foundation, um, which was a great organization, great and grateful for them uh, for doing that for me, bringing me along. Uh, I learned a ton, um, got to see the places I've been reading about for a very, very long time, and Normandy is one of them. So that was a very uh, influential experience on me uh, and kind of how I've come to this topic and why I think it's so important and kind of why I just research it personally. Um, so and then as a result of that and kind of the application process, uh, I found finally a bit of a family myth, but uh, found a relative who had been killed at Juno Beach uh, on the 6th on D-Day. Uh, so that kind of really opened opened up a whole lot of emotions, obviously, for me and my family, but a lot of doors and kind of ways of research and looking at this and having that connection, I think, has made a major impact on me. It's something I think about quite a lot. Um, so that's kind of why I kind of do this and why I look at it. And obviously, I'm a bit biased towards a lot of it, um, which I'm willing to say right up front, but um, I still think it's kind of important to know. Uh, so that's kind of why I do what I do. Uh, so I can just launch into it. So the first, what I wanted to do is I've got a couple that are uh, general texts and then I get more specific uh, as I move along. Uh, so the first one that I really, really, really started to look into when I kind of started the PhD process and learning more and kind of getting back into history because I was out of it for a while um, was some works by Tim Cook. And uh, this one, hopefully you can see that okay, is kind of the first one I want to talk about. Sorry, get my fingers out of the way there. Um, so Tim Cook is a great author. I'm sure a lot of you know that. Um, I'm sure that's not a surprise to many of you listening. Um, the way he's able to blend uh, academics, research, archival research, I mean, working at the War Museum, Canadian War Museum, uh, has obviously put him in touch with a lot of sources, um, but he is a great researcher as well. Uh, but his text and his writing um, is really for what kind of drove it home for me about history in general. I mean, his earlier work works were... Uh, the big popular ones were about the First World War. Um, so um, at the sharp end and, and shock troops, like those are the books, shock troops especially is kind of what got me back into uh, doing history. Uh, I was out for a while, like I said, um, was on a medical leave, uh, came back uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do um, while that was getting resolved and kind of changed my plan. And, and Tim's book played a huge role in that, shock troops actually. Um, so I've always been kind of... Um, Obviously, I have an affinity. I've worked for him uh, multiple times now at the War Museum. Great organization, very supportive of me. Um, so again, I know that's a lot of glowing praise, uh, but the book is is very, very excellent. Um, it's something I enjoy going out, going in through over and over again. I use it all the time uh, as a research. It's kind of like my reference uh, text in a lot of ways. Like I've done writing on uh, D-Day, obviously, um, some stuff in the inland in the early days, which we'll get into with some of the other books. Um, looking at things like uh, the Flays Gap, um, his descriptions, his research is great on that uh, uh, on that element. So I would uh, I would highly recommend if you haven't read Fight to the Finish, uh, do so. Um, it's it's great. I, I mean, it's it's got all the kind of things you would expect from 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 Tim and the way he writes. 
Um, but again, it's just a great, great reference text. Um, if you're really wanting to learn more about Canada during the Second World War, um, Canadian soldiers. But also another great thing about this book, it's not just an army focus. I mean, it, it is because in a way Canada's war, as is popularly perceived in my opinion, is focused on the land battles and that kind of thing. Obviously, I'm not belittling the contribution of the Royal Canadian Navy. Um, very important, probably Canada's most important front. Uh, and I'm not the only one to say so um, for the war because of the supplies brought across the Atlantic uh, and the war uh, against the U-boats uh, was huge. And also the bombing campaigns under bomber command uh, of the RCAF uh, was quite an important part. Again, that's a controversial topic. Um, but with that all said, again, my opinion is a lot of that today. Um, this book talks about that. He does that as well with um, the first, uh, first volume uh, of the series. Uh, I think, um, yeah, sorry, I just got distracted. Someone just put up their, their, uh, um, uh, their choices, which I want to get into a little bit, which is great. So if you guys do have choices, five choices or any choices uh, of your five, as I'm calling it, your five does not be the five that you like agree with the best, whatever, just your five, uh, you can put them in uh, as a comment and we can, we can talk about that moving forward. Uh, sorry, going back to this. Yeah. The other books by Tim Cook, I suggest them all. I put a link in the description uh, for fight to the finish. Um, and that being said, all those links, yes, I do receive commission if you do buy them through those links, but that commission will be incredibly helpful for me uh, to keep the channel going because uh, I can't do this without any, you know, some, some sort of money and any financial contribution is greatly appreciated. Uh, so that's, 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 that's an important thing uh, for me to kind of keep doing what I'm doing and everybody's support is, is great. Um, also, if you could, if you don't subscribe to the channel already, please do. Uh, and like the video as well, please, because that's very helpful. That's how the algorithms work is the interactions with the videos. So if you could like the video, comment after as well, uh, that would be great. Um, putting whatever you want, just even your five books is good. We can keep a running record of this kind of thing, um, which I think might be fun if people like this idea, we can do it for other topics. Um, so that being said, um, going back to fight to the finish, uh, I think it's really good. Um, a few things that I, I think are unavoidable with a text like this that's focusing on things about like soldiers, perceptions of war, um, what they went through, their accounts uh, is really, really interesting. Uh, but that being said, there, there's an issue. Of course, there's some, what you would call, again, it's a very complicated topic, but like this sort of bias, people call it, I mean, we're all biased. I said that from the beginning, but this idea of this pro-Canadian, a little more rah-rah, which I don't think is fair um, for Fight to the Finish and uh, another book we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but it, it, it's really, really an, an interesting, um, it's an argument and it's a fair one. And I think in a couple aspects, I mean, a lot of Canadian historians have done it. I've done it. I've been accused of the same thing, being a little too nationalistic, uh, that kind of thing. So it's, it's something to keep in mind, but that doesn't take away from Cook's work at all. Uh, it's very much, um, very much uh, something that I think everyone should check out, uh, not just Canadians. I think it's it's a great way to kind of put Canada's war in a context from a Canadian, but it's also valuable uh, if you're interested in the Second World War generally, because um, it really puts Canadian troops, sailors, aviators, kind of as they are on the front line and kind of understanding that experience of their war and everything that they did. And, and Tim Cook's book is is really, really excellent uh, at that. It's that kind of in the moment kind of feel to these things. And Tim's writing obviously backs up um, and helps a lot with that and blending it all together. I mean, again, it's an incredible book. Um, so if you haven't read it, I highly suggest you do get it from wherever. If you can buy it through the link, that would be greatly appreciated. But like with all these books, I will say now, get them where you can, they are great. And if you could buy them through the links, that would really help me. Uh, so we have um, someone giving their list here. So I just want to stop and look at that real quick, because I think we have a lot of uh, a lot of things in common here. Uh, so Fields of Fire, which is a great work, which I'm going to talk about, we'll get to, along with Stopping the Panzers. Um, that's one uh, also I'll talk to about, sorry, moving forward. Uh, no Holding Back, that one I'm not too, too familiar with. Um, there's some that I have missed. Uh, so also, if there's books that I don't mention or they don't come up, please do comment on them so I can kind of get an idea of what everyone's thinking. That would be awesome to kind of get a track of what everyone um, thinks I missed or should talk about or should change my opinion on, whatever, just kind of let me know. 
Uh, Blackburn, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I've used it in like more of a reference kind of way, some research I did. Like I mentioned, the Canadian War Museum kind of used it for that. Um, uh, it's just, it's a bit pricey for me to find, so I just don't have a copy of my own. Um, but it's it's an excellent work uh, from what I've been able to to get into it. I mean, it was just very short, but, I, but I've been able to use it. And the last one, I'm terrible with pronouncing names. I'm apologizing for that. But uh, Caravaggio is another one I have not got to yet. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's one I do want to get to. It's just, um, like I said, I'm a little tight on money at the moment. So I'm trying to get books I can. And the university, unfortunately, even though I'm still waiting to defend my PhD, has cut me off. So I don't have library access, only public library access. So it's going to be a bit hard to uh, kind of get that going. Oh, okay. Yeah. So hold on here. So no holding back about Totalize, um, which I can talk about. I want to talk about moving forward uh, a little bit with some of the other books, kind of getting them into them uh, about that and kind of the overall theme that I've kind of pulled from all of these works uh, is, 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 is an important part of that. Uh, so one of the themes that I, I was going to talk about this later, but I might as well get it out now, is the idea, and I think this applies to the Allied um, war in Normandy generally, is that the Germans were better soldiers. Um, they were always, they were better. Uh, the Allies only won through technical innovation and uh, good supply lines and numbers of troops, that kind of thing, and able to you know, reinforce everybody. Um, so that that's kind of uh, a thesis I do not agree with, um, and neither do most of these authors or all of these authors. Talk about, and I mean that's central to um, Fields of Fire, which we'll get to. Uh, but uh, and that, that's in here as well with uh, Fight to the Finish. It, it's 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 in here. It's not a big part of it, but it, it is in here. And, and that kind of thinking that the Germans are these superior soldiers in every way, shape, and form is is has been hugely and unfortunately very uh, negative in terms of how we view the war and the fighting in Normandy. Uh, the German, some of the German generals had a huge impact uh, on official histories, histories written after the war. Uh, their accounts were taken, um, I would say, sometimes more seriously than others, that they somehow had the, I don't know, like the inside edge of what real or real or, you know, good fighting looked like. Um, and again, that's been kind of picked apart for decades, but it's still there. I'm I've talked about this online, on Twitter, maybe in some other videos as well, um, but that that's not the case, right? I mean, I've been on Southern videos talking about how the 12th SS was not that great of soldiers, you know, kind of brainwashed teenagers uh, led by thugs in the Eastern Front. Uh, it doesn't make for best soldiers. It makes for, you know, brutes and, uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but um, it's just not the case. And it still comes through because there's a lot of and I would say very carefully, on you know, very pro-German sentiment of how they fought. And I just don't think they were as good um, as a lot of the older texts make it seem. And a lot of these texts are the result of kind of that theme uh, that's kind of come up as this Germans were better. The Allies only won because they could pummel their way across Normandy. Uh, and even if that being said, why is that a bad thing? That I'm not too sure about. Uh, I mean, the idea of winning a war is to win, not winning so that your enemy thinks you did it properly. Uh, that is just something I don't fully ever really understand. And it's informed a lot of authors, um, Canadians too, about how um, Normandy's viewed, which is, is to me is, is very strange. Um, and not really sure why it's so such a, you know, a sticking point for a lot of people. I mean, you win to win, you don't win to lose, you don't fight to lose. That's, that doesn't make sense. You use every advantage you've got. Um, so that's really interesting. So kind of going back, uh, bad, taking back a step, one that I didn't really include um, in my list, but it is just as important. Um, and I have it right here, the, uh, the official history of Normandy. Um, like, of the official history of Normandy by C.P. Stacy, as you can see here, Victory Campaign. Uh, so it's not just Normandy, uh, but it does talk about D-Day, the whole campaign, that kind of thing. Um, so again, like I said, this is a, um, a very important text, obviously, because it set the foundation uh, for how Canadian contributions in Normandy um, are viewed from here on out, because the records were closed for so long, and all people had was news reports, uh, reporters' views of these kinds of things, and, and Stacy. Uh, 
And Stacy's conclusion, which I don't agree with, particularly with D-Day especially, is that they could have done more. Uh, they should have done more. Uh, they had the objectives that they did not reach, um, which nobody did on D-Day. So, and I mean, some of the objectives um, were obviously ludicrous, like taking Colin on the first day is, is, is crazy. I mean, the attritional warfare that developed uh, even early on, I'm not even talking about uh, towards mid-June when the, you know, the pushes like uh, that come from the British beaches uh, kind of developed while well, the Canadians were kind of in a holding position. Um, like that was not going to work uh, in that sense, especially because they knew that the Germans had access to get to Normandy. They knew they were going to try uh, to get there as quickly as possible. A few units, you know, as the SS tends to do, did a bunch of massacres and it's kind of slowed them up. Uh, so that was really uh, something that they knew was going to be coming. So why put a whole focus on Khan? I mean, it comes back to something I wasn't going to talk about today, but earlier planning, understandings of German warfare, what they could, the Allies could and could not do, all that kind of thing. So it's just kind of like a holdover. Uh, but everyone now uses that as kind of a, a stick to kind of beat, not everyone, sorry, I shouldn't say everyone, because that's not true, uh, is to kind of, focus on that or what they didn't do instead of what they did do, which I don't think is very fair. Um, so, and Stacy does that too. He's one of the setters of that. Um, why that is, I'm not sure. Um, I, I haven't done too much personal research on Stacy the man, a, a little bit. I've done a little bit. I've read the memoir like most people. Uh, that doesn't really give uh, too much, too much insight into kind of the thinking here. I mean, he spends a lot of time talking about uh, Diab which rightfully so. I mean, but his kind of personal experience with that is covered in his memoir, uh, but not Normandy to what I remember uh, anyway, because um, it's just, it's something that I'm sure people have looked at. Uh, his, you know, his papers are available at, uh, at uh, U of T, I do believe, Massey College uh, to be looked at. Uh, so I'm sure there's work on this. I just haven't looked at it in quite some time. But anyway, with that said, um, Stacy plays an important role of how we understand these things and, and what people are reading. Because like I said, it's still read. I still use it all the time. Uh, but people outside of Canada especially use it because it's accessible. It's been around for a long time. Um, that really kind of sets their the tone and the opinion uh, of, uh, of Normandy. Uh, and just a really interesting comment here. Um, and this isn't the only time I've heard this. Uh, someone, <laughs> Childrake Six, if someone once told me, we have Stacey, why write anything else? Uh, yeah, I mean... That's kind of another ludicrous thing to say. <laughs> Is this not the be all end all? I've heard that uh, for Stacy with Victory Campaign um, from many sources. Uh, I've had it, not Victory Campaign, but I, I've had that directed to my own work um, with the first volume of the three volume series, uh, Six Years of War with, with Hong Kong. It's He's talked about it, what's the point? So it's kind of like, Okay, it's missing, it's got holes. Uh, there's new research, there's new everything else. Um, it's it's just really interesting um, to how this kind of, I don't wanna say influence, I was gonna say shadow of Stacy, but it's still there. It's still there today. Um, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. But that said, if you can get it, get it, read it. Uh, it's good, the writing's kind of dry, it's an official history, that happens. Um, but it is still interesting to kind of see where these foundations are laid. Uh, that's a hugely important kind of um, thing I wanted to get across with this starting early is um, that Stacy plays a huge role in kind of how these things are viewed. Yeah, so here's another uh, interesting point um, about Terry Kopp, what he mentioned, uh, and, and I'm going to get to get to him shortly. Uh, so it says Terry Kopp remarked that due to the Cold War, early post-war historians did not confront political indoctrination and coercion involved in the perceived German success. Right. Um, there's a huge Cold War influence, obviously, on official histories, other things. Um, like I don't want to go on, a, you know, on rabbit hole diatribe kind of thing, but with the Kurt Meyer story, politics plays a part in that as well. I mean, there's people that argued it was about personal perception and guilt of that of the Canadian leaders, you know, who stayed as execution, that kind of thing. I don't really think so. Uh, to me, it's more about politics at the time and kind of the rise of West Germany and the importance it played once it became part of NATO, especially, uh, and how that kind of went. Um, but again, I don't want to go uh, too, too far down that rabbit hole. Uh, so that's just kind of uh, an interesting way to think about it, too, is something that cannot be forgotten. 
uh, is the context of the books. I mean, it goes for all history books of when they're written and who's reading, who's, you know, who's writing them and why. I mean, that's historiography it can be kind of boring uh, for non, you know, academic historians. So I won't do too much of that, but this is kind of, <laughs> uh, sorry, getting, these comments are pretty good. <laughs> so that's pretty fun. Yeah, it's going to come up. Sorry. Um, yeah, everyone take a shot, something, water. Um, it turns out he was a beer salesman to Canadian soldiers in West Germany uh, later on. So that's always uh, an interesting part of the story, rather unfortunate, uh, however, due to his actions. Uh, anyway, so that being said, I want to move on to one that's a little different uh, than the, kind of the rest on the list. So this one is fairly new. Um, let's see if I can get this. In the, from Jonathan uh, Fennell, Fighting the People's War. Uh, so he looks at... Um, the British Commonwealth, the British, sorry, British and Commonwealth armies of the Second World War, not just Normandy, it's the whole war. Uh, he does, I think, a great job uh, with the sources available now uh, and kind of taking a different angle that the idea of um, morale, uh, you know, that kind of thing, the, how the war is going can affect uh, fighting ability. Um, he looks at, uh, you know, the German invasions of West Europe in 1940, you know, with the BEF in France and kind of makes conclusions on that. So again, I would really suggest this one, it's it's new. Uh, I don't know if it's in paperback yet or not, I'm not sure, um, but the, the link is also included in the link below, so check it out. So it's a really interesting one, looking at the idea of using things like, uh, hold on, sorry, I have it right here. Um, the stats on rates of sickness, um, battle exhaustion, self-inflicted wounds, desertion, troops going absent without leave. And sense of reports, um, because as soldiers wrote home, the, their commander, usually their commanding officer, had to go through their letters and censor them uh, so that that information that might be beneficial to the enemy uh, doesn't get out uh, accidentally or through letters or that kind of thing. So, But what that's used for is kind of to see what the troops were thinking, what they were talking about, um, what affected their morale, how does that impact the battle? So he kind of looks at, at, at these different factors, which I think he does a, a fairly good job at doing. Um, uh, the only things that I take issues with, and please, if you have a different opinion, please, please let me know. Um, but the idea of, uh, of sickness rates and battle exhaustion, um, which has been looked at in, in detail, um, and that was shown, you know, shell shock, different terms for it in the First World War. Um, but I do take issue with kind of focusing on those two in the sense of sometimes that's beyond um, the control of the individual, uh, like sickness. I mean, could you say they're, you know, making it up? Possibly. I'm sure there were people who did so to get out of the line of battle. Um, can't really blame them given the circumstances of fighting, especially if they're a conscript, because there was conscripts in the, uh, in particular the British Army, uh, Canadian Army later. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's really interesting um, looking at um, that in that sense, but I just don't necessarily agree as the best use of that one. I think there needs to be more caveats on that. And then battle exhaustion, um, particularly what we know now um, with PTSD, uh, what that does to the human body, mind, uh, mindset. Um, again, that's, it's not that, yeah, it's going to rare on you and battle is going to take a toll. Uh, all kinds of soldiers have said so, you know, there's one that's often expressed is there's this, uh, everyone has a limit, you know, you, some are different, some are lower, some are higher, they can take more, some can only take less, but once you reach it, you reach it, and that's kind of it. Um, but again, there is tons of things, even in, in Venel's work, about guys coming back, um, just needing a break from the fighting. Um, so again, is that indicative of morale? Um, I don't know. I'm not too convinced about that. The other ones make sense. I mean, self-inflicted wounds is a big one. Uh, and then the letters themselves are huge. I mean, there's dips in morale. Um, he talks about things like um, after total eyes in Normandy um, about the Canadians uh, is that is when one of the, the battle exhaustion units mentions that they're at the peak of these cases. Uh, and because for those who are not aware, total eyes at the beginning, Canadian troops on the front line were accidentally bombed. Um, causing quite a number of casualties. And obviously that's going to, you know, shake your morale a little bit when your own bombers are the ones causing the problems or ones hitting you because there was some confusion with smoke, um, what that meant, what it didn't mean to different sides. Army meant one thing to the Air Force, it meant something else. So that causes some issues. Um, so that kind of obviously has an impact on it. Uh, and also by totalized by early August, uh, the Canadian troops had been fighting for quite a long time 
uh, and had been seeing some tough fighting. I mean, I talked earlier about why it took so long to take Khan, but because it's this attritional warfare. Uh, it's not quick. It's not easy. I mean, it, we've seen that in all kinds of cases. I, I talked about this. Mike Bechtold has talked about this. Tagging in Normandy was never easy, no matter who you are and what you have. It's not very easy, um, particularly um, in the Canadian sector of the line. Uh, and we can get to that with, with Terry Kopp's book real shortly. But uh, it's just a really interesting way uh, of thinking about morale and kind of, sorry about the noise there, uh, about um, how these things go. Uh, one thing that I did want to point out that is not connected um, to this and is a huge, I know this might be another drink moment, but uh, the criticism of Monty, I think that's going to be uh, another common theme that you will see across all kinds of books on Normandy. I mean, his command, the 21st Army Group, has been criticized to the nth degree and then some, um, and Fennel's part of that as well. Um, he argues that the, the, the Sorry, that Monty had not trained, which, again, is not really his responsibility. Should it have been as the overall commander? Probably, yeah. Um, but uh, he says they didn't train properly, uh, which is also a big part of, of, of Fennel's book, right? Training, um, which the Canadian troops had lots of, right? Um, some did, some didn't, um, which he talks about in here. Uh, like troops of, uh, sorry, the 2nd Division, uh, which had fought at Dieppe. And we know how that we all know how that went. Um, so kind of training these new troops and then getting reinforcements in who were not properly trained, um, so to speak, for the fighting in Normandy. Uh, there's all kinds of accounts of you know reinforcements coming up at night and being dead by the morning, um, which I think Fennel has a good good argument there. The training's lacking. Is it Monty's fault? I don't really think so. But and this goes back to the whole. And I don't really want to talk about this because it's not excuse me, my focus, but this idea of the colossal cracks strategy, you know, this overwhelming firepower and blasting their way through. Um, Fennel's kind of critical of that in that sense uh, because he argues that they were able to get in, as he calls the assault phase, the break-in, uh, but the breakout uh, from the beaches was not done um, as it should have been, which I think is fair, um, but it kind of, it lays on the shoulders of others, I think. Um, down to the, you know, the really, really minute levels of, of, of command uh, with Normandy and kind of how this is all going. And the Canadian Army has its issues with reinforcements in Normandy with lack of training and integration, and that kind of thing. I mean, there's lots at the beginning, but that slowly wears on um, as the battle goes on, just making it more difficult. So, yeah, I don't want to talk about that one too, too much more, but it is a really interesting book. Um, what I really appreciate is, it's like I said, someone who works on Hong Kong, is the focus on the East, learning about that, like Burma, um, the fighting in East India at the time, uh, the fighting of the Australians in New Guinea, that like all this stuff is endlessly fascinating to me. Uh, so again, like I said, it's not just the Canadian book, um, but it does give some really interesting insights into Canada's fighting in Normandy, a different way to look at it, um, a new way to look at it. And, and it's, again, it's really, really, really well written. So again, check it out. So the next one um, is probably on a lot of people's lists uh, is Fields of Fire by Terry Kopp. I have the second edition, um, which is also the link below. So check it out. Uh, great book. I mean, it's a foundational book. Sorry, I got a bit of an itchy nose today. I don't know what's going on there. Um, it's a foundational book um, on understanding Canada and Normandy. I mean, it's a response to people like Stacy, uh, and who I want to talk about now, a bit of John English, uh, who kind of is very critical uh, of the Canadians in Normandy, saying they weren't good enough, like they're buying into that kind of German argument that they didn't fight properly and they didn't do what they could have done. Uh, so that's really, really interesting. So it's, it's, it's kind of a rebuke of all of that. Um, so, and it's really important, again, this is sneaking some historiography in there. But if you're reading other stuff on Normandy that kind of takes that angle, I would suggest Cop's book as kind of the other side, changing how you see that. Um, and then really it does get into good stuff, kind of the, the nitty gritty of Canada's war. And the title Fields of Fire, I think, like I said earlier, is important because it talks about the nature of the fighting. I said earlier that it's difficult to attack in Normandy. That's because certain parts of the of all of it, really, there's different factors in different parts, but the Canadian part especially is literally there are great fields of fire. Like, it's just a great place to defend. Like, the Canadians did it. 
Germans did it, the British did it, the Americans had their own set of issues uh, in their sector with the Bocage and that kind of thing. Um, but again, it's just, it's a difficult place to fight. And, and Terry Cobb talks about that and kind of why they didn't achieve these kind of victories as it should have been. Um, it's not what it should have been, you know. He kind of goes after that. And this had been building for decades because this, I believe, is originally published in the early 90s. Uh, I could be wrong on that. I'm not entirely sure um, when it first came out, but it's kind of that foundational change of things, kind of this sort of rehabilitation uh, of the Canadian um, uh, view, sorry, the Canadian reputation in Normandy, um, about those who had kind of tried to disparage it in a way, um, Canadians, non-Canadians, everybody kind of did it. So, so cop kind of, um, brought something new, uh, to that. Uh, so there's that, um, and he again talks about the myth of the German superiority, all that kind of thing. So you can check it out for that. Um, what is really interesting, uh, also for this and kind of has had a huge impact on me. Uh, and other authors who talk about this as well um, is using the battlefield as a as a primary source. Knowing what the ground looks like is hugely important in military history. Lots of people do do it. I'm just saying, Cop invented it. That's not what I'm saying. But bringing it to Normandy, uh, and I was at a conference many years ago, um, and he was speaking. Someone asked him a question about. I think it was about fields of fire. I don't remember exactly uh, about how, what you know what part you know, understanding the ground place. He said, First World War, not as much. Um, it's a farm field, a lot of farm fields. They all look the same, flat kind of thing. Again, this is his opinion, not mine. I kind of disagree. But with Normandy, he said it's absolutely crucial. And, and I agree. Um, understanding the way that the ground plays a part in a battle is is huge uh, and cannot be dismissed. And, and Cop does this. He does this as well. He talks about this. He's been a tour guide for uh, I don't know. I don't know when they started this early nineties again, just like the book, the battlefield, I think it was the Normandy battlefields foundation, Normandy foundation battlefields. I can't remember again, sorry. Uh, but that has now evolved in the Canadian battlefields foundation. Um, with this idea of going, seeing the ground um, plays a part in the history. Obviously there's commemorative elements to that too, uh, but it, it, it plays an important part. And, and there's been videos lately of uh, Le Maison Alpatry. Uh, that's a huge one. Um, Paul, um, Woodich with World War II TV did um, with Mike Bechtold uh, a live stream of the ground as it is today, which has hardly changed. Uh, and, and you can see the, the role that such a small change in elevation played uh, in that battle. I mean, the, I mean, what else to call it? The absolute slaughter of the first Tsars and the Queen's own rifles that day on the 11th, June 11th. Uh, huge role. I mean, they, the Germans were in a slight reverse slope and the tanks came over the rise and they got blown away um, which happens in Normandy often uh, and that's kind of one of the few I won't say good performances of the SS because I think I had someone yeah agree with me here um, that they're not elite um, but politically preferred our favorite which makes sense Scott I think you're bang on it has everything to do um, with uh, the politics of the SS or Nazi Germany, all that going on. Um, that's a huge one. Oh, yeah, before I go in here. Um, yeah, so the, the Canadian Battlefield Normandy Foundation founded in 1982 and changed its name to the CBF in 2005 um, when they expanded to cover things of the First World War uh, and DEP uh, as well, which is what I got to see with this tour. Um, so once things get back to normal, I know I'm filming this. Hopefully, I'm hopefully towards the tail end of COVID. Um, any students out there or anyone who knows a student who might be interested in this or isn't and might want to learn about it, apply when it comes up. I applied on a whim, kind of. Didn't think I'd get in, but did. And 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 it was literally life-changing for me in so many ways. Um, so I highly recommend check them out. Uh, and if you can, donate to them. They do great work. Uh, important work, I would argue. Uh, like I said, it was life-changing for me, but also in the sense of commemoration work that they do. They commemorate numerous battles, um, uh, particularly around fillets, uh, and, or is there one around fillets and two in con, um, our CBF like memorials. Uh, so check them out. They do good work. And if you're a student go, when they come back, hopefully next year, 2022, uh, hopefully COVID is under control, um, apply. 
So that is, uh, is uh, something you should really, really look into uh, and help them out. Sorry, I just read a comment here real quick. <laughs> yeah, so here's a good one. Um, I heard this myself, heard it the other day on another live stream somewhere. Um, I think it was the Mason Patry episode. Someone was like, oh, that's not what I expected it to look like. Uh, that's not what I expected this sector, this sector or this area to look like. That's not what's in my mind's eye of Normandy. Uh, this idea that it's all Bocage. Um, it's not, not even remotely at all. It's not like, just like with perceptions of D-Day, I mean, even Omaha is not all cliffs. Like it's not all cliffs with bunkers. Um, all of Normandy is not Bocage. Like that's not the case. And that's why I think even the title of the book I'm talking about now, oddly, Fields, Fields of Fire, is important because that plays a role. I mean, yes, the Germans had Fields of Fire in the Bocage, but other parts, it was more important. Um, it, these ideas of it, it's difficult to attack, it's this open ground, it's great taken country. I mean, the photos, the battles, uh, everything from, yeah, like I just said, Maison Patry, uh, to the actions of the Hearst Azars with uh, Lieutenant Henry, which I'm hoping to get, uh, um, which I'm hoping to get out soon. It's just running into a few difficulties with that, with other stuff I've got going on. So again, any support you can give me, sorry to keep plugging that, but I do need some help. Would be great so I can get that one out. Um, I really want to do that one. It's just been a bit more difficult lately. Um, so that's a good, good one. Uh, I'm hoping to talk about, but anyway, sorry, the, the, this open ground um, around the the line, the Oak line, uh, around things like cities, uh, sorry, the villages like Puto, Redville, that area um, are perfect. I mean, there's lots of things online you can see about that. Books as well, they all talk about this. All the Canadians, the specific ones that we've gotten into now with Normandy with uh, Fields of Fire, uh, and we'll get into it. The other one's moving up shortly. Uh, but it's an important thing, and I think reading these books can really, like, what is always one of my goals is changing perceptions. Uh, and these books play a huge role in that because they are Canadian focused, except for Fennel's book, obviously, but it, it, it's important to understand what's really like on the ground and coming back to the CBF tour, because uh, I've got some info here is they'll be doubled in 2022. So after I'm finished uh, for anybody watching this after I'll put the link, uh, to the website and any other things I can find, like the social media, that kind of thing, uh, for the, the CBF. Uh, so if anyone's watching this now or later, you have access to that, check them out. Like I said, this doubling is huge, which is a great idea. Normandy and the Netherlands, that's, that's massive. And that'll be a great experience for those who go. So, so that's just kind of my thinking with Fields of Fire. It's this, it's been updated with some new info in the second edition, which is the link below. Um, Great read. I think I plowed through this one real quick um, before going on the battlefield tour. That's when I first came across this was uh, just before I read it. And I even brought it with me. Um, I'm a bit crazy. I bring kind of heavy books with me when I probably shouldn't, but I did. I brought this one with me uh, to Normandy to double check some stuff um, while I was uh, on the tour. So to me, it's been a hugely important book. So the next book I want to talk about is one that was already mentioned earlier by somebody else um, of their picks for books. And I think it's an unavoidable book uh, now with understanding the Battle of Normandy, um, Canadian role, all of it. I mean, you, if you avoid this book, you're making a, a mistake. I mean, this is in terms of, I mean this for everybody. I mean this for the casual reader. I mean this for maybe the amateur historian. And I definitely mean it for the academic historian of any nation, any stripe. If you're not reading, this one, you're missing out because it makes a huge argument. And like I said, I have bias. I do. Uh, the next two books are Mark Milner, uh, but he is great. <laughs> I can't. I can't go around it any other way. Uh, he was the uh, Dave Patterson was the one tour leader uh, who knows his stuff. He, he knows his stuff a lot. Um, he knows the ground of Normandy like none other. And Mark Milner, who's my other tour leader, like I was very lucky to have these two gentlemen tour, lead the tours. Uh, he knows these battles inside and out. I mean, all of them, like we were at um, Beaumont Amel and he's given us crazy details about things that people say are not his focus. Like, cause he's supposedly a naval historian. Sorry, I like doing air quotes, which I probably shouldn't do on live stream. But anyway, um, 
he knows this stuff. It's it's amazing. He's been there. I don't know how many times he told us in one of the, the, the videos he did uh, around D Day or last week or so. I can't remember which one, but he's been there like twenty something times. Like you can't you can't discount that. Like, like that's huge. And and his arguments here are are, are massive. Uh, really important to understand. Uh, I reviewed this book academically, in that sense of the word, with um, uh, Canadian military history. The link is in the description. Uh, for my review, so you can get kind of my, you know, more thought out, not kind of live thoughts. But uh, the things that strike me most about Milner's book is the use of artillery. Uh, that's massive um, in the Canadian sector. Like I hadn't realized until reading this book, the role that artillery played in uh, the Canadian battle in Normandy. I mean, it's massive. They are added so many guns, extra guns uh, to the th to the third division when it lands because they knew that the Germans were going to counterattack because that is German doctrine. It always was both world wars counterattack ASAP. Uh, and that's kind of what they did uh, with the, uh, on the, the day. I mean, they went in between the two beaches, so they didn't really make contact with anybody, but they did counterattack. Uh, and, and, and as the days moved in, as the story as the advance moved inland and the campaign went on, uh, they did, they counterattacked all the time. It's German doctrine, take it back. Uh, and the artillery plays a massive role. Because of the title of the book, Stopping the Panzers, it's a hugely important part of this. Uh, they go on, Detroit, the Germans just throw everything they got at them. And the 12th SS are part of this, uh, but also the other things that he talks about are the early days here. Um, kind of these piecemeal attacks that the Germans throw in. Uh, places like Cardinville Farm, which I've been to, um, have a couple of pieces of the brick that got old and fell off. Was on the side of the road, didn't go on proper property, but anyway, that was like a little memento for me to kind of remember uh, what had happened there. Uh, and also, that's nearby where um, Lieutenant uh, Henry, Gordon Henry, and the first Azars, along with some of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, Sherbrooke Fusiliers, yes, um, where's the Fort Carry horse? One of the three, I can't remember. Oh, sorry, one of the two, uh, support his attack. Um, they're going to reinforce and they kind of run into some German panzers. And Henry is uh, in command of a firefly, so uh, Sherman with a 17-pounder, uh, and just causes all kinds of chaos um, for the for the Panzer counterattack. I mean, they, they don't even know the, where it's coming from. They think it's mines, and he gets off in a remarkable uh, amount of rounds. I mean, Milner's account of all of this, and why I think this book is so important and important to me, because like I've said many times, First is ours is one of my hometown units. Uh, this account that's written by Milner is one of the best. Uh, you can't beat it. Uh, so I highly suggest you get this book. If you haven't heard of it before, do it, read it, get it. It's amazing. Uh, I, you know, I'm not being very academic here, but I don't know what else to say. <laughs> it's uh, it's a great book. Um, you should read it, uh, check it out, and really absorb those lessons. If you're interested in Normandy even slightly, these uh, lessons are huge. Uh, the things he talks about. And another thing I think he does well like Cook with Cook's book is these personal accounts, these little details, these little anecdotes. They are an immensely important part of um, the, the book. And, and Milner's father fought in Normandy with one of the, um, with the Royal Artillery, Royal Canadian Artillery, sorry, 13th Field Regiment. So he uses kind of his father's insights into these things to kind of get an understanding. Because like I said, the artillery is such an important part of Canada's early days and moving forward. Excuse me, um, with this. So things like the fighting at Brettville, uh, when the when you know when the Panthers attack at night, um, they play a small role in that. But uh, things like that or Puto, uh, where there's this kind of back and forth struggle, um, which I did a live stream with Mike Bechtold about. Uh, you can check that out on my channel, and I'll put the link in below after. Uh, the kind of the role that artillery plays once it gets online. Once it gets online, there's many difficulties in the early days in Normandy about getting the artillery online. Uh, it, it, it's an important part. It's an important advantage. Uh, and again, and why that's a bad thing, I don't know why anyone would argue that. That doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, it, it's in a massive part, and this kind of stopping the Panzers really opened my eyes um, to the role that artillery plays. Uh, and the armored units, I mean, maybe my idea of the popular perception before all this research Normandy is an infantry battle. It's the slog through. I mean, then things break out after Khan, and it becomes this kind of mixed, you know, combined arms battle. When well, that's not the case, it's always a mixed arm. You know, sort of combined.
find arms battle. That's always kind of um, what it's been. It's just not looking like you would think it looks. Like again, that earlier comment about off Normandy being Bokash, it's not the case. Uh, so these combined arms doctrine, which is a lot of it is learned on the ground, unfortunately, which comes with the cost of lives, uh, it is what it takes sometimes in war uh, is to learn. Again, I'm not a veteran, no combat experience at all. Uh, but from what I've read and what others who have have said so is what it takes sometimes. Uh, and I think Miller's book does an excellent job of that. And it's a fairly well-known book, but if you haven't heard of it, check it out. So the last one I want to talk about is one that I just finished reading, um, but I have used it before uh, for all kinds of different stuff. It's a tiny little guy. It's also by Mark Milner, like I already said. But... So right here, there's the D-Day to Carpe K. So it's about the North Shore Regiment of New Brunswick, um, where Mark Milner is from. Uh, so it has that kind of connection like the first Cesars do for me, um, that hometown sort of home area connection. Uh, it's a really good one. It's a short little read. It's only about 100 and was 120 something pages, not even. I read it real quick um, after actually getting to sit down for the first time and kind of getting into it, which I had not been able to do bits and pieces, uh, but not as much as I want. And another cool part, I mean, this is kind of childish, but I think it's kind of fun. Let's see if I can get this on the live stream. See here um, is the famous, it's a still from the famous photo. Uh, another one I have on my channel of. Uh, uh, the landing at, um, it's not saint Albon technically, uh, but the landing's on Juno, the one from the video of the camera in the landing craft. So if, if I can do this properly, if you flip through the pages, which is pretty hard to do with only one hand and myself, you can see that it's on every page and it kind of goes along. Sorry, once you have it yourself, you can do this better. I think I did this on my Twitter easier uh, the other day. But anyway, so you can check it out. Maybe you can try it this way. Uh, it's a cool little part. Maybe this is better. Yeah, it's not working. Okay, anyway, uh, so that's a cool little tiny part. But uh, yeah, so this book to me was eye-opening in a lot of ways. Like I already knew most of this. Um, so that it, like it was an important part of this. I went on, like I said, the Battlefield Tour with Mark. So I got these insights well before reading this. But not everyone gets that opportunity suggest you get this book and read it it's a quick read but it's so interesting i think i sent a tweet out last night saying that mark miller is a great storyteller he's a great historian but some historians are not great storytellers for mark he is both great historian great guy um been very helpful in my career and what i try to do uh, but also great storyteller like i was gripped by this reading it and not stopping like i mean that doesn't happen much for me anymore um like reading all of this is is intense. Like he goes every, he goes through everything with this unit. I mean, the training, who the unit even is, what they're made up of, um, the changes that it undergoes, uh, the landing itself, um, and yeah, it is it is Bernice Um I, There's a tiny little part of Bernice Mare that they landed at. It escapes me at the moment. Uh, it's not important. It's in the book. Uh, Mark will tell you about it when you read it. Uh, is um, Sorry, let's just throw this back. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's technically right at the border area between the two uh, towns on the beach is where the video is from and where the first, uh, first to start, the North Shore Regiment lands uh, on the 6th. Um, isn't that little in between? And it kind of looks similarly there today. A few buildings have changed. Again, he talks about that in here um, because of experience on the battlefields uh, is, is, is usually important for something like this. Uh, so it's it's really interesting. The things that strike me the most um, is the description. Uh, yeah, also, sorry, I'm reading the comments as I go along here. Um, I agree. I hope so, too. I mean, this literally, it does what it says. It, it, it's, sorry, I'll let it longer. It's, it's just D-Day to Carpe K. That's what the cover art is here, a uh, painting of the destroyed hangars at Carpe K Airfield. Um, it's, it is that. It just... It just covers that short little time period, um, which I think is is really, really an important period to cover because the two things that strike me the most, getting back on track here with um, book, sorry, is the descriptions of uh, the defense, not, yeah, holding the line at Le Maisonel Patrick, right? Like I already talked about how the first is ours and um, the Queen's Own Rifles uh, were basically slaughtered on that day, on June 11th. But that doesn't mean the area was just given up, right? Uh, the, the North Shore Regiment comes in and holds that line 
days and days and days. I mean, the things that they describe in this book are just kind of, excuse me, after reading everything I've read, things like fillets, the fillets gap, the things that happened at Saint Lambert. Uh, even these descriptions are, are quite striking. I mean, holding the line, they talk about, the, you know, the burned out halls of the, the Shermans and all the German tanks, but just the number of dead surrounding that field is just, it's shocking. And, and talking about the chaplain of, of the, uh, uh, of the unit, uh, the battalion, um, you know, burying bodies while this is going on of other units. It's, 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 it's a, striking thing to read. Uh, so that is obviously a big part of that book because they're there for a couple of days uh, holding that and they get pulled back uh, and then they get pulled back for the attack on Carpe Um, which their part goes according to plan. Again, I use the air quotes because yes, it does, um, but at a very, very high cost. And, and this is a huge part of the book, obviously, because it's in the title, but kind of the scale um, of what happens uh, to the North Shore Regiment. I think talk, they, they talk about it in, uh, I think they still talk about it today in the unit. Again, I don't have an affiliation with them. Um, is that, that the old regiment died at Carpique, uh because of the because the number of casualties from German artillery, the attack not going uh, as to plan, uh, is kind of thing. So the, the attack on Carpique on the 4th of July um, they lost, uh, well, it says 170 casualties, but they lost 46 dead. Uh, and it was said to be the worst day of the regiment of the war. Uh, but also Milner says it's the best, one of the best because they help wipe out the German reserve in the area, right? Um, because they, they brought up the Panzer, the SS Panzer divisions, which should not be using these roles, but it's all the Germans have. So they throw them in um, as counterattacks and the allies know that that's what's gonna happen and just blow them to pieces. Um, so that's kind of, I think, part of this myth is that the SS leaders or the German leaders who survived the war and write their accounts are like, well, if we had it on even playing ground, whatever that even means, that wouldn't have happened. But the Allies use what they have, because why wouldn't you? Uh, again, I know I'm harping on that point, but it's, 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 it's an important part of all of this, my understanding of Normandy, all that kind of stuff. So to me, that's really, really important um, to understanding this. Uh, but anyway, this book is great. Uh, well, there was one of the maps I marked that I thought was a really standout effort. Um, I think they're all made by Mike Bechtold, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this one covering the art. Sorry, right, a bit of a glare here. Um, it's all about the defense of Carpe K once they take the town. Uh, this map is a good one. I mean, all the maps Mike does are amazing. Uh, I had one made for myself. It was awesome. He was really great in helping me. Anyway, uh, the maps are great. The pictures are good. The personal insights are awesome. I'm not sure how many people even know about this book because it's it's not very well known. Uh, I mean, it's a tiny one about a tiny, not a tiny, sorry, sorry to the North Shore. I don't mean that. But an underknown regiment. I mean, they kind of uh, had some lineage changes, uh, but they've gone back to being the North Shore Regiment again. Uh, so this book is a great one. Get it. If you don't have it, read it. I also at the link below. Uh, for those in the UK, I'm sorry I couldn't find a link um, uh, through the, the the services that I use. Um, but uh, get it wherever you can. Um, sorry, so yeah, so Scott has got to find that book. Well, it's in the link below, so you can get it pretty quick. I think it's in stock uh, with the, the Canadian service I use, which you can see below, which is Indigo, uh, by the way. Uh, so if, yeah, if you really, really should check this one out, I highly suggest even owning it because it's a great little one. It's a great little reference for this regiment, but also kind of, if you need to understand what Normandy was like in the Canadian sector, it does an amazing job. And he does talk about the other units like the Chaudière, uh, Queens on Rifles, uh, that kind of thing. But obviously the North Shore Regiment is the focus. Uh, but anyway, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about with this last one here. Um, it's a new one. It's a new read for me. Um, uh, it's a great one. Uh, great stories in here. There's one about a soldier, an SS soldier being taken prisoner, um, complaining about his treatment <laughs> at the hands of the Canadians, which is kind of funny if you know the you know the SS track record in Normandy when they took Canadian POWs. I mean, yeah, they punched the guy in the face. At least they sent him back alive. Um, a lot of Canadians didn't get that chance to be sent back alive. Uh, some did. Uh, some which I'll be having a live stream about, but I'll talk about that when I wrap up. 
So that's pretty much um, all I had to say. I'm surprised that I could go on and on and on like I do. But uh, is, if there's any other questions or burning concerns or anything anybody wants to talk about, I can do that. I know there's a bit of a delay, so it's going to take a second if anybody has anything. But um, again, just kind of flipping through uh, this book, uh, Melner's book here, it's it's a, it's a good one. Uh, the descriptions of things that you haven't even considered, like the fighting in the tiny little village, uh, Teoville, uh at the end uh, of, well, not the end, sorry, on, on D plus one uh, is great. I mean, he's got anecdotes, he's got maps, personal things. Uh, Sheldrick Six, thanks for joining me. That's really appreciated. Um, one of the few people watching live, so that's great. Um, thanks again for watching. So everybody, uh, thanks for watching. Um, that's kind of what I was trying to do here, a little different. Try to talk, talk about an event through the books that I use. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, something different. If you want me to do something like this again with a little, little more detail or a different topic, please leave it in the comments uh, below. Uh, not in the side chat. Um, it's it's easier for everyone to see if you put in the comments below that'll be available or do. And please like the video so more people see this and can kind of get an idea of what I'm trying to do. Um, if there's any topics you want to see, please let me know. Um, obviously, Hong Kong is my dissertation, so I could do that for days and days and days. Uh, but if there's anything else, um, uh, different insights in the First World War, uh, all kinds of topics, or not even ones I'm not familiar with, please let me know. I will do my best um, and we can talk about that uh, however you want. So and maybe we can have some people on next time. I don't know. Up to you. Leave me comments. Um, get in touch with me. Uh, I'm up to whatever. I'm open to doing whatever that says got going for you guys that are interested. So I do have another live stream coming up on uh, Saturday, uh, June 19th at 2.30 Eastern. Uh, so I'll be chatting with uh, Amanda Shepard who wrote a book and is also, I believe, a uh, CBF alum like myself uh, about her great great uncle who fought with the uh, Royal Winnipeg Rifles and was captured as a POW, I believe, outside Puteau uh, and survived. Whereas a lot of the, uh, the Winnipeg Rifles uh, who were taken prisoner did not uh, because they were taken by the SS. So that is going to be a great story. Uh, please join us. Um, the, ch the link to it is in my channel. I'll be tweeting out about it and all that other good stuff uh, moving forward. Uh, but please do join us. Um, it's great to kind of have someone on who's got that family connection, but has also done the good academic legwork that you need in a history book. Uh, and getting to chat with them live about the book is, is a great opportunity. So don't miss that because um, it's going to be a good one. Uh, but after all that, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, have a good day and I'll see you next time.